serious basis, I really do appreciate you coming out today. Uh, I don't think I need to introduce myself as I looked over the crowd here. There's very few people here that I don't know on a personal basis. And I think that most of you know me and you know uh, what I stand for and, and how I've been active in the community for the last uh, 16 years. Uh, like Brad, I was born in Wausau County, raised in Wausau County. I feel like I've served Wausau County my entire life. A good portion of that, for 20 years I was in the military, served all over the world. Even as I was serving in the military, in my mind I was serving the people of Wausau County. Since I've been home, I've been very active in the community. Uh, I, I don't know, but I've I, I suspect I'm the only person here that's ever been to an Arthur Lee Andrews Memorial Scholarship function to uh, raise money for his uh, the scholarship for that. That is the kind of thing that I do on a daily basis in the community. There is practically nothing that happens in Wausau County that I haven't been a part of from uh, decorating the senior center for, for the uh, fourth, uh, Christmas in July to you name it. Decorating a vacation Bible school. I'm, I'm a servant at heart, and I'm serving. I want to serve Wausau County. Now, what are my qualifications? It's a good question. I've got a master's degree in operational management from the University of Arkansas. I've got a bachelor's degree from Florida State University. I've got a general uh, appraiser license from the state of Florida. I've got a broker's license from the state of Florida. I've been active in real estate for the last 16 years. Since I retired from real estate, I came home and got into real estate. Uh, I, I'm, I tell people, and I'm not kidding about this, I'm the world's worst realtor uh, because I, am, I do not enjoy getting people to go buy a house that they really can't afford. I'm not a good realtor. And so using that information and, and discovering that that's not my forte, I got into property appraisal. And uh, it, it takes a long time to get a appraisal's license. Uh, in, in Florida today, you, you have to start with a college education, and you have to get 300 hours, a, a minimum of 300 hours of training, and then a minimum of 3,000 to get certified general license, which means you can appraise businesses or houses. You've got to have a minimum of 3,000 hours of on-the-job training under the supervision of another certified appraiser. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, I've, been a, I've been a real estate appraiser for 25 years. I've been a professional appraiser for 25 years. I started in 1992, and I've been state certified. I've held the, the, the state certified general license since 1996, and so I've been a, a state certified appraiser for 20 years. I also have experience in mass appraisal. I have all the courses out of the way to become a CFE. I just uh, chose not to because at the time I was working for the Department of Revenue, property appraisal staff and get pay raises. So I did not, I didn't bother getting it, but I do have the education to get that. Um, I currently work in the General Services Administration. I'm the regional appraiser of the Southeastern United States. I cover 13 states. And I'm the only one that covers those 13 states. Everything from Delaware and Maryland all the way down to Florida and Mississippi. And I deal with disposing of large properties that the federal government no longer needs anymore. We're one of the few federal agencies that actually put money back Prior to that, I was the chief appraiser for the Division of State Land for the state of Florida, which is pretty much the highest level appraisal position with the state. It's, uh, it was, I, I ran a staff as a 
appraisers as well as his administrative staff, and that he drove the land acquisition for the state as well as disposed of the property for the state. And uh, prior to that, I, I, all these were appraisal jobs that I've had. I mean, I've been a member of the state, uh, I worked for the Department of Revenue, and I was over the tax roll evaluation and approval process for all 57 counties, including Ocala County. And so when they say they have to have the tax roll approved and the tax roll passed, that was, that was something I managed. Um, I've appraised many properties in the area. Um, I, I, I've been a small business owner. I owned an appraisal business. I used to specialize in American Angle, similar to what you're going to be hitting across the Ohio Highway coming up in the near future. And uh, I, I'm a, currently a Sandbox City Commissioner, and unfortunately I have to resign from that in order to run. And it's been, it's been very rewarding being a commissioner in a small town like that. If you ever want to be a, actually get elected to something, you just throw your hat in the ring and they'll say, okay, good. Now, now I don't have to do it. We got somebody that'll do it. So it's been, it's been really nice doing that. And uh, let me just close it up, though. I really appreciate being here. Thank you all. And I uh, appreciate your vote. Thank you. I'm always taking it. Thank you. Don't sit down so soon. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm going to walk into my next question for you, if that's okay? Yes. What distinguishes you from other candidates running for the position of property appraiser? In essence, why are you the best candidate for this job? <laughs> I, I would have to say I have a, a unique combination of having um, the experience of both of these gentlemen. Uh, one has single property with few appraisal experience, and I've got approximately uh, 15 years from doing that. And the other has mass appraisal experience, and my experience working in, in, in the property tax oversight part has given me that mass appraisal experience. I have the training in, a, in mass appraisal systems as well as in doing single property appraisal work. And they both come into play working for the, for the property appraiser's office. You need to be able to do mass appraisal, but there are a lot of properties that don't fall into place for mass appraisal. When you're trying to appraise a golf course, there's one in the county. One is the mass. It's the same as a single property appraiser. And if you're appraising a marina, there's, well, there's two in the county. So is there two still? There's usually one. No, there's two. Yeah, there's, yeah, there's two. And uh, there's, there's a few in the county, but you know, you're not doing those by mass appraisal. You're doing them by single property appraisal. So it's really important to have experience in both. It's important to have the education and experience in both mass appraisal as well as single property appraisal. And that differentiates me from both of the candidates. And I, have, I do have both. I have uh, this vast experience in running appraisal programs in my own business, through being over the quality assurance section for a, a, a appraisal organization for the state of Florida. I've had over 40 appraisers. I, had, I was as the chief appraiser for the state of Florida. I had a staff of appraisers that I ran. I've mentored, I've educated appraisers for probably about 15 years. And uh, I just was recently teaching a appraisal class and a real estate class at the Federal Law Enforcement Training Center in Brownsville, Georgia. And you think, why, why would you be teaching an appraisal class there? Well, there are facilities all over the country. They have these large facilities that have real estate in them. They have cell towers that they lease out. They have uh, land that they dispose of that they don't need anymore. They have land that they're buying because they need to add to their facility. So they, they actually have their own real estate staff in those agencies. So we spent three days in Brownsville actually teaching Stepping into a position like this, I can bring a lot to the county, I can help train the people in the office, I've got this background in both mass appraisal and single property appraisal, and I think that differentiates me from others. That's it. Thank you very much. Mr. Brennan? I think what, uh, the, the, first I'd like to uh, say thank you to my son who was here when I, I meant to introduce him when, when I first uh, opened up, but uh, I forgot. Sorry about that, Stuart. He's visiting down, he's in the Army. Uh, he's back for a couple of weeks, and so I appreciate you taking the time to come out here today. I, I, I appreciate that. Um, the thing that differentiates me, the main thing that uh, makes me different from my two opponents is I'm the only person sitting at this table that has recent experience appraising your house or a house like yours. On a daily basis, I'm in this county, throughout the entire county, appraising houses. I've appraised houses this week. So that is the primary thing uh, that, that that sets me apart from the other uh, candidates here is that, that I am qualified, I am experienced, I know the county. There is virtually not a single dirt road in this county that I have not gone down either looking at the house itself or looking at comps or looking at sales, those sorts of things. But that, that's really what different differentiates me. 
not that it's that big a deal, but I'm the only guy here who's got a master's degree. I'm the, I'm, and master's degrees are not all that important. What, the, what a master's degree really does is it gives you a breadth of experience. It, it, it teaches you how to think outside the box. The more education you have, the better you are at thinking outside the box. And I think that Wausau County needs somebody up there that really thinks outside the box. I will tell you, I'm not somebody that I have to introduce myself to you. All of you know me because you know that I am involved in this county. To be honest, if I'm not elected, I'm still going to be involved in the county. So that's, you know, not elected, but it won't keep that from happening. I'm still going to be involved in the county. I'm still going to be a member of the Gridiron Club, uh, mainly because they were so good to my son when he was playing football at Wausau High School. I'm still going to be going to church locally and knowing people. I'm still going to be doing appraisals in the county. So the, the main, it, 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 is, it is the breadth of experience. You know, I've got 20 years working all over the country, no, all over the world. Uh, I've been the liaison between the United States military and foreign nations. I've been in embassies, working in embassies, dealing with diplomats and the and th all this experience comes with me. And, and while uh, you know, I'm not going to be dealing with any diplomats here, I will be going to the state capitol dealing with legislators. And I will be interacting with other counties and doing things with other counties. And I just think if you look at the whole person, that I'm the guy that's got the best experience to do the best job for Wauwatosa County. But let me say that I think both these guys you, you really are lucky that you got three guys out there that do a good job. Thank you, ma'am. Yeah, I feel like um, the main thing that, that, that's different about me and, and these two guys here is that I'm the only one that's actually worked in the hospital. I have 12 years experience actually working and doing the responsibilities and understanding what we do. I've, I've been there when the real estate market was going through the roof and we were processing 6,000 plus deeds per year to go into it going stagnant and not having sales to look at. And as far as single appraisal versus mass appraisal, you know, yes, we're required to mass appraise all properties, but we do have to look at individual properties and, and determine whether or not those, those properties have, um, you know, certain things that may make them more valuable or less valuable than the ones that are around. Also, I am daily appraising properties. Um, no, I'm not a certified licensed appraiser. I can't come to your house and charge you a fee to appraise it for the bank, appraise it for loan, or appraise it for sale. Um, but I am the only one here that's, that's doing tax appraisals every day and assessing those values for tax purposes. But, but the office is much more than that, and, and that's where I go back to say that I am a little different here. I'm, I manage the budget for the last 11 of the 12 years I've been here. Um, I've overseen the changes in technology. When I first got there, there were two personal computers in the office. Um, now, of course, we have a computer for every person that works there, and most of them have at least dual to quad monitors so that they can more efficiently work. Um, I've also got <coughs> screens, so I understand the mapping situation that we have. I understand that processing, and not just for the, not just for our office, but also for planning and zoning, because we do have two of them. We also handle all of it for E911. So, um, our office also does damage assessment for emergency management when there's a natural disaster. I'm the one that I'm the coordinator for that. I have been since 2005. So. I understand that process. That's not a part of the regular appraisal process. So there's a lot of things that, that our office does, but the primary thing that our office does that we get away from talking about here with, with appraisals is our office works, works for the people. We're the people's office, and we're there to listen to their concerns. And, and not just if they come in for something that's planning and zoning related, send them off to another office. We, if we can't answer that question, we pick up a phone and find out what it is. If we can't get somebody on the phone, then we need to walk over and explain it. Because sometimes people don't quite understand what they're looking for. 
perception that is not fairly perceived. Because they look at their neighbor's assessment, and they'll say, my neighbor's only paying $300 in taxes, and I'm paying 2000 and I don't know that. And so there is that perception. So there's a public trust issue that needs to be addressed, and I think that can be addressed through outreach, through going out and educating the public. And you know, really, if they can, would come in, I would say nine times out of 10, there probably is an answer to that question as to why that is going on now. Either it's a discussion of limitation or it's, uh, you know, they get a senior exemption or, or they've lived in that house for 60 years and, and you know, it's, uh, they're protected by the, I don't say affordability. So regardless of whether, you know, what they feel, I mean, just actually to treat them fair and equitably, treat them fair and equal, and make sure everybody gets a fair shake on their taxes, and I think to educate them through community outreach as to why certain things are certain ways, and that way they're precisely not going to get protected by the trust system. Do I own a business? That's what I'm just saying. Absolutely. Uh, I own VRG appraisal. I assure you that if I'm elected, I will no longer own that business. I will no longer have any sort of financial dealings with that business. I will completely leave that business. I will maintain a, a license, but I will not be doing any appraisals, fee appraisals, in Wausau County for the entire time that I'm in, in business. Uh, my wife owns a business. Uh, she owns the little black dress. All you ladies need to go down there and you know, buy something from her <laughs> if you would. Uh, but that is absolutely no conflict of interest as far as I'm concerned. I will tell you one other thing. Uh, I will not personally, nor will I allow anyone in our office to take advantage of what very poorly known rules to give themselves, or, and I certainly won't take advantage, uh, any sort of deductions from their taxes and things like that. Uh, that is not commonly available to everyone else in the com uh, community. It goes back to the trust issue that I think Steve touched upon. Uh, I think that anybody in public office has got to be above the law. You can't just meet the law. You have got to be above the law. And, and if you can't live like that, then hey, go start a business and, and do whatever you want to, but don't be in the public business. Thank you. Federal government, and I do not have a small business at this time. I would be resigning from that position uh, when I get elected so that we have time to take care of it. I'm going to maintain my state appraisal certification because it's a pre professional certification. It's difficult to get. And once a bachelor's, it's difficult to get that. Um, you know, as far as in the office, uh, I will not be contracting with people in the office to do any type of work, uh, regardless of whether it's legal under the statute or not. I, I believe that that does violate the public trust. And the perception of that Believe it or not, it's not up to me to determine. I don't know. I'm not a lawyer. I'm not a. I'm not a judge. But I mean, that's up to, for other people to determine that. But the perception of that is there, and I will do everything to protect the public trust and promote that in, in the office of trustee. Thank you. Uh, uh, that you would implement to improve the performance of the property appraisal process. It all goes back to. Thank you. Uh, it all goes back to. It all goes back to fair, ethical appraisal. I would like to see uh, our, if, if someone comes in and, and people commonly come in and say, hey, I think you got my property misappraised. And uh, let's use a, uh, a, a rental subdivision off of uh, Martin Luther King Road. It's all five acre lots in there. Uh, every single lot in there is, is assessed today at $25,000. They might have changed it today. It was assessed on Friday at $25,000. Every single lot. One lot is literally knee deep in water today. It is in the uh, flood zone. It's got a base flood elevation of 13 feet. It's assessed at $25,000. 300 feet away, there's another lot, high and dry. It's in the X flood zone, which means it's not a flood zone. It's assessed at $25,000. One is virtually of no value, and the one has real value. I would like to see anytime someone comes in with a with a uh, question or challenges a uh, an assessment, that that same challenge would would work for other people in that area. I would like to see that challenge uh, 
expanded to more than just that one property. I'd like to see it expanded to, to all the properties in that area that it is uh, pertaining to so that every single one person doesn't have to come in and make that challenge. And that would be the, the, uh, the one, I mean, if you, if, if you limit me to one, that would be the one that I would entertain. <laughs> through public outreach. And I, I, I haven't seen much in the way of public outreach from the property appraisal's office in the past few years. And I mean, our, our property owners receiving the exemptions and the assessment limitations that they're entitled to. I mean, if, if there is anything that you can do, I mean, I don't, I, I don't mind going out to festivals and, and, and to events and to the senior center and setting up a table and bringing the computer and logging on. And if someone wants to come and sit and look at the property with me and, and we can discuss, you know, possibly what exemptions are available to them anything like that through public outreach, I would definitely be willing to do that. Because I work in the office, I, I have a better knowledge of what is there now. <coughs> and I don't feel that there's a lot that needs to be changed. Um, to answer the question of, of outreach, and you can always do more outreach than public outreach, but currently our office does that. Also, um, you know, depend on our local real estate agents to, to, to get that information out, and title, title companies as well. We work with, with all of those. And so we do outreach that way. Um, and as far as, as, as trying to help people with their, with their um, assessment, when we do get information in about a property that has some kind of reason that it might be at a lower value, we, we look at that. One of the things we do look at is we look at low property. Um, however, not every property in the county is assessed by the acre. A lot of them in subdivisions are assessed by the lot or by the buildable site. So you do run into a case where you will have a, house, a property that you may have one that's higher than another one that are both buildable, but there may be desirable co uh, in interest that, that outweigh the higher one on the lower one. And, and you have that along the coast. All of our coastal properties are, are flood zones, but they are more desirable. And so you do have those things, but when we see something, we do, we do uh, try to address it. Equitable and effective methods which you use to verify legal descriptions of properties. Say that again. Yeah. What fair slash equitable and effective methods would you use to verify Verifying legal descriptions of properties is, well, it's not as simple, but the source of the legal description is going to be deeds in most cases. And so you might have a property there that was sold by a deed 20 or 50 years ago, and there's been five or six different cutouts on it. People tore off pieces and put them thrown in there. So you have one deed left in the set, another deed left in the set, another deed left in the set, another deed. And it gets into the pretty technical, but you can, you can through the GIS system, situations coming up, and I've seen this in a lot of counties in the work I've done all over the state, when there's a large eminent domain project that's coming up, uh, th there's not a deed. When there's a taking from a property, there's not a deed for that. There's what's called a quarter of taking. It's recorded in the court. And there are many, many instances in, in property appraisers' offices where the land size is too large after the taking because they don't think you can award it. So you might have what was a five-acre tract before they take the acre of road frontage off of it, and the property appraisers don't know that the order of taking is actually
actually the transfer to the presenting agency. So through that order of taking, that would be the source of the new deed. It would be the old deed of five acres left in effect that order of taking. So there's, there's a lot of different small things like that that some people may not know about. I know a lot of property appraisers around the state don't know about that. That's something I work with a lot of agents with since the property appraiser some years back. Thank you. 
additionally, it is the account for all property and tax that owned or affected the trust value. And, but it, it's, much, it's much more than that. I mean, I, I think the main role of the property appraiser, the elected property appraiser, is to serve the people of the parish, is to serve the needs, and to provide the absolute best service available, to provide it in a, in a fair and equitable manner, and to protect the public trust. I mean, like I said, when, when we've been out talking to people, a lot of the people do feel that they are treated differently than other people. And whether that's called through community outreach or whether there is actually an issue there, uh, it, it's, to me, the main role, though, is actually serving the people of the county. I was a poor kid in a poor county. My mother was a bus driver. My dad worked out in the pulp wood fields out there. There were men in this county that changed my life. Pat Hart is sitting back here, who's, who's Brad's dad. Uh, he was the bus garage mechanic when my mother drove that garage. And I looked up to him. He didn't know it. Uh, he didn't know I was looking up to him. But I looked up to him and said, one day, I want to do a little better in life than, than what I, my parents are doing. There were other men in this community that made huge differences in my life and that kept me from uh, spending my life doing menial labor uh, much like what my father did and I believe when I when I retired from the military people would ask me because I was I was doing okay in the military and people were like why are you retiring uh, I said it was mainly because of my family they said well, what are you going to be I said I don't know what I'm going to do but I know what I want to be and I said I want to be a pillar to the pillar that children can look up to and when I'm 75 years old there will be nothing better than to have some child walk up to me who is 30 or 35 years old and says Mr. Brenner you don't know it but I was watching you and I think that is the main role of any elected official of course we've got to do our constitutional duty that's a given but way more important than that is to be that man that the children in this community can look up to and say, when I grow up, I want to be something like that guy right there. I, I want to I emulate him. And that's one of the reasons why I'm out in the community the way I am right now, is because I want children to look at me and say, I can do something with my life that nothing in my life indicates that I can do that.
said about having an older house and a new house is true. But since 2008, when we voted in portability, you can have the opposite. You can have somebody that's been there for 15 years, have somebody that just came in, and they're able to take their portability, which is the difference between their assessed value and their market value, and bring it with them to their new homestead. And now they're paying less taxes than the person that's been there for 15 years. So if you look at our website, and you look at your property, and you look at your neighbors, yes, there are a lot of times that you can see an inequity. That doesn't mean that one's being treated different than the other because of favoritism, but it means that it could very well mean that because of our statutes and our legislation and our rules making that's been implemented, it has created this inequity. And the same thing goes for whether it's a a personal exemption like a, a senior's exemption that applies, um, veterans exemption. A lot of those things can be why another property is, is lower. So we spend more time, honestly, in the office educating people about uh, the tax process and, and the changes that have occurred than we do about actually dealing with appraisals and, and whether or not there's a negative issue with an appraisal. So, yes, I, I think outreach is, is very important and you can never have too much of it. Mm -hmm. um, so now we've got a few questions from the bar of the property appraiser or they're on the part of legal assistance or deputy director. Uh, there's an example I found recently downloaded the tax rolls from the Department of Revenue website from Corgi and looked at all the properties that are assessed under $100 in the county. And there's a surprising number of properties assessed under $100 in the county. Most of them there's a reason for. A common area in the subdivision is assessed at zero because it's, the, the value of that is worked into the value of each individual lot or property in that subdivision. But you go through and there's there's lots in Tennessee that are assessed at $40. Ohio mm -hmm. dry lots are not wetlands and they're assessed at $40. Why? I don't they don't have great road access to them, but I pay forty dollars for them tomorrow. And I'm sure most of the people in the room would also. <laughs> but to correct that, though, as long as it's under the same ownership, <coughs> we can raise it to four thousand dollars, like all the surrounding lots are. But next year, due to the ten percent assessment limitation that was voted in a few years ago, next year it'll be forty-four dollars, and it'll be forty-eight dollars and forty cents. So to try to correct it, though, can be a long-term issue. Right. Uh, even though that question is for Mr. Casey, I would make sure that you put your minutes to back on those two lots. I assure you that no matter which one of us is the property appraiser in 2017, there will be mistakes in your role. It, they will not be, it will not be a perfect role. And some mistakes will be internal, and some mistakes will be something that, that was deemed to us that was a little bit wrong. Uh, so so to, to pretend like any of us can have a perfect role just can't happen. And the way you handle that is, is you just switch the roles. You, you just go, you go in and fix it. Uh, uh, there is a difference. There is a, well, we can go into try to explain all the different values on the tax roll, but the, the uh, there is always that one that says, what is the market value of this roll? And that one should always be pretty close. Now, all the exemptions and all that, that's also calculated in there and, and might give you a different value for that property. But there's always that just market value, justified market value in there, and, and that should be as correct as possible. Thank you. Well, as, as both of them said, that's already what we do. If we find something that there's a mistake in where we fix it. Um, we're human. Our data entry people are human. You know, you're going to have clerical errors. You have, and, and not just internally, but the same thing. You have clerical errors on deeds prime example of that, I had a gentleman come in today that couldn't understand, he had his trim notice, he couldn't understand how he had this 16 acre piece of property and, and how it had gotten cut out of his, his property. He owns several properties. Well, he has two lots down of, down the Smith Creek and he had, him and his wife got a divorce, they separated the property and when they wrote the legal description up, it only included one lot, it didn't include both lots. So he now has one lot in his name and the other lot is in his ex-wife's name. You know, 
we have to report the instrument that comes in, so we created a new parcel number for that and you know, as it's reported. But is it a mistake? Yes. And it has to be fixed. Okay, good. <coughs> you mentioned the word human. Uh, if not, how can this be avoided? take more pride in helping people and giving back to the community and not just to the office. But yes, you know, if you're in that situation and you have people come in and, and you're able to help somebody, yes, this gives you a personal satisfaction. There is there is the opportunity for personal monetary gain through the process. You have got information that nobody else has. You, you are provided information that nobody else has. And if you're, that is why it's important that you look at more than just uh, who's worked there or gone on this or, or other things because you have got to elect someone that's got uh, completely above the board. And I'm not suggesting either one of these guys are not completely above the board, but but your property appraiser has got to be completely above the board so that they don't use their knowledge for personal gain. And it's more than just personal gain. You also have to ensure that, that you know, my son's standing back here. You know, he doesn't get a great deal on a piece of property that nobody else knows about. You know, I, I feed him information so that he does that. So, so yes, there is, there is the opportunity for personal gain. And, uh, you know, that is... That is an integrity issue. Uh, I, I think that his that Brad's answer tells you that he's got sincerity because it never even crossed his mind he would do that. <laughs> uh, you know, the property appraiser does get a lot of, of information, and then you know there is such a thing as a taxpayer's bill of rights. That's in the statute. So one of the one of the bills of rights, one of the rights that you have is, a, is the right to confidentiality. So when you provide information about the income and expenses on your commercial property, you have the right for that to be confidential. And yet, and the property appraiser property appraiser can get information, the sales tax information on every business listing, and use it in order to assess the property. <coughs> and every person's business in the county is available for the property appraiser to get. So you have to have a property appraiser with the trust and the integrity to protect that information and make sure it doesn't leak out so somebody can use it for their own benefit. Uh, folks, we've got one more question, and then we've got closing um, voice from each of you. So the last question from the audience, one minute, is if Amendment 4 passes this August, what doors will that open for what color county residents and business owners? So I think you've explained what Amendment 4 is. I'll, I'll be happy to do that. Amendment 4 is the amendment that, that says if you invest in solar energy and, and you put solar panels on your house, that that Amendment 4 says that stuff will not be assessed against your house. That that prop, that those uh, improvements won't be assessed on your house. It's not to say we won't know about it. We won't be in principle. We won't tax you on that. There's good and the bad about this, guys. The good thing is, is gosh, the, the, the state or the county is not allowed to tax you on something that's good for the environment and good for everything. Now, what's the bad? What, what can be bad about this? The bad is the more people that have solar energy on their house, the less people actually have to have what is now all those power lines running down the road, which cost massive amounts of money. Fewer and fewer people would be paying for that because they'll be having solar energy on their house. And so it could raise the, the cost of electricity for those people who can't afford to invest in solar, which is not a good thing. Again, it's expensive being poor because the poorest people would be the ones who would pay the most for solar. I mean, talking about Amendment 4, and there's information, uh, Florida Tax Collect has a um, link on their um, website that, that has a lot of information about it. First off, there's already an exemption for solar and all renewable energy on residential property. Um, this, this amendment has nothing to do directly with residential property. 
what it actually is doing is giving the legislature the ability to make a decision to approve that exemption for businesses or not approve. So we're not giving the exemption to everybody right here. We're elect, we're, we're giving the ability for the legislature to do that. Um, there's good and bad points about it. I think anything that gets us away from you know fossil fuels into renewable energy is a great thing. So it's not a bad thing there. Um, what it will eventually do, um, and, and the concern could be, is it could eventually take dollars off the roll. Um, a prime example, if Progress Energy came in, oh God. <laughs> <laughs> you repeat the question again, it's been a while here. Um, so then the court has this August, what doors will that open for what current cavities, residents and business owners? Uh, Brad's absolutely correct, there already is already says that solar and renewable storage energy devices are in the general category. So amendment four is for business, businesses, well, that is designed after businesses, as well as uh, energy companies for like a solar plant. Now, would it affect the current tax rule? I mean, if it does not exempt the land underneath, say someone came in and wanted to put a solar farm on 60 acres of property. Well, it's not, the land would still be taxed the same way as it is, except the equipment personal property taxes, paying for personal property tax, and any of the pro anything that's currently affixed to the property that is in running in solar is also the exempt. So there's already, it's already in the Constitution for residential. It's not expiring. I've heard people say that's expiring. So you already have the right to, to be exempt from the tax for solar and renewable energy. It's already there. So is it going to have a big impact on the county? Not likely. I mean, on, on edge issue, I don't believe that's a property appraiser issue. You know, as far as the property appraiser goes, it's not going to really have that big an impact. First of all, guys, thank you for coming out. You, you took time out of your, uh, your, your life to come out here and to listen to us and to talk about why we want to be property appraisers. That is a huge compliment to us, and I appreciate you guys coming out here. I encourage you to, we've got lots of information about all of us that's available, way more than what's been said here today. I encourage you to, to look at it all, to look at all of it. I am happy to report that I don't believe you're going to get a bad property appraiser. Um, I think that all of us will be able to do the job, any one of us will be able to do the job. And so uh, for that, I'm very happy. And, and I just encourage you to look at it. Choose the one that you think is the best overall person for the job and then vote that way. Come out and vote. Appreciate it. It's an honor to be here. It's been an honor to run for office in the Tulsa County. I mean, it's a humbling experience. And um, there's, there's a difference between working for somebody and serving somebody. You serve God, you serve your country, you serve your family. And as a public servant, if it's, you serve from the heart. You don't serve with your, your hands, you don't serve with your, with your brain. You serve with your heart. And to me, it's important to be a public servant because it, it is. It's, it's, you do it with your heart. I mean, you put everything into it, and you do the best you can for the people of the county, you do the best you can to protect the public trust, and you know, that's what I'll do when I'm elected to property appraiser in Tulsa County. I'll do my absolute best. I appreciate it. Thank you. And uh, I think that no matter no matter what you're going to get somebody that, that has education, that has qualifications, um, but above all else, this office and any office in our county is about serving people and about <laughs> being able to engage with someone and and like Steve said it's about heart it's about how the heart should be um, and people being able to feel that they can trust you with and that's the thing that I feel like does make a difference for me is, is I've been doing that for the last 12 years in the office and I have built those relationships and I'd like to continue to build them with everybody else in the county
you personally and law enforcement in all of Northwest Florida to know that if anything happened to any one of their family members, I would be the first one that they'd want to call. And the people that are in this building right now that know me are shaking their heads.
with the citizens and the business and everything. That's what the that's what the parents tell me is going on in the school system. Drug problems in the schools. I didn't say that. They came to me with that when they found out I was running for sheriff. You have to be able to talk with people. You have to be able to communicate. You have to be able to get a plan of action and, and follow through with that. into a restaurant or they go into the junior food store or they go get a cup of coffee at Hardy's and they go in there and start talking to people instead of walking to that counter like I see a lot of them do now and, and turn around and walk back out, those, those officers are not going to be successful officers if they cannot communicate with the people. I have been a great communicator with a lot of people. Sometimes when it comes time that you had to arrest somebody, yeah, that communication might break down. But you have to be able to talk to people. They have to understand what you're saying and be able to treat everybody the same way. Mr. Creel, um, same question. Uh, what do you think is the most important skill? skill of the <coughs> well, communication is one of them. Is one of them. Yeah. But listening to people. When I get into office in the morning, I've got a stack of phone calls right there. And I get phone calls all day long. People just want you to listen to them. They don't want you to talk. They don't want to hear you. They want you to listen. They're calling because they've got a problem. They want to explain what their problem is. That's all they want is you to listen. And when you have your phone this week and you, when a, a lady's dog got run over on the east side of the road and, and they showed the allegation that, that one of our deputies did in West Virginia, we found out that is not true. We got video cam off the scene of that. That is not true. And the lady, all she wanted to do was listen. You just listen. And that again, buying information. I don't want you to get involved. I'm going to stand down. I want to find out what kind of heartless person ran over this dog. I'm going to know more than that. I wouldn't even like to have charged him because there's not enough law on the road around here to do so. But they want you to listen to them. That's all they want. You listen to what their problems are. Maybe give them a little advice. Maybe point them somewhere else where they can go. But just listen to them. Mr. Mills? Most of my points brought up good, good suggestions, but trust to me is the, one of the number one issues that we've got here. The deputies have to know that they can trust their sheriff. Citizens have to know that they can trust that deputy that responds to your call when you call someone and the deputy's going to come out there. they got to trust that we know what's right, trust that we're going to do what's right, and trust that we're going to treat you right every time and we're going to follow up with your call and we're going to respond to you as citizens deserve that. You deserve to trust that we're going to do what's right. Um, Mr. Creel, I'll start with Jack and then Mr. Parker. And it's a record. Would you keep it the, on the same direction or would you change course? No, I wouldn't change course. I'd keep it on the same direction, but um, you've always got to tweak things. You've always got to, you've always got to change things. Um, we're, we're looking now and we're I buy the thing. Get your price down a little bit. It, it makes them a better deputy. It's not just over their shoulder. But it, it, it creates trust with the community knowing that they can't file further complaints against our deputies, although they are very inferior. That's one thing. That's one direction we go. Um, I think if there might be some realignment, if this would be some, some cross training to get people in the positions they need to be in um, so that we can better use their skills. But as far as the direction, Burglaries are down. Our budget's been flat for the last 12 years. We're running through. We, our, our drug enforcement program, we are hitting the drug dealers hard in the head with that. So, no, I wouldn't change. I would fix things, but I wouldn't change them. I would make them. Okay. All right, Mr. Uh, Miller, same question for you. Absolutely. Assess the recent performance of the Sheriff's Department and its elected. Would you keep it on the same direction or would you change course? Two minutes.
contributed to several different things, but no, we have to rebuild, restructure, and reunite. There's no way we can keep going the way we're going. I've heard it said at Table Valley, you have to restructure the Sheriff's Office. You have to start from the top and go all the way down. You've got too many supervisors and not enough deputies. You've got majors and captains and lieutenants. You don't need that. You, you can stop and cut that out. You might, you might be able to have a captain and a lieutenant or two lieutenants in both divisions, but <coughs> having majors everywhere and having uh, captains, you, you, you can't keep going the way you're going right now because, first of all, it's costing too much money. And if the sheriff's office is in the hole right now, he's got to come up with ways to bring that back out of, out of the black. He's got to workshop. You all need to go through it again, August 25th. We talked about the sheriff's office's budget. It's a mess. minorities hired in the sheriff's department at every level? If so, explain. If not, why not? And what would you do to ensure diversity in hiring well-qualified minorities to the department at every level? Well, there is not equal representation at this time. I know Sheriff Drill was mentioned that he's got a, a, a major and a captain in the jail that African American, but we do not have equal representation. And I would recruit heavily for the people within the community. There's people in the community that I had a call from a guy the other day that has asked for a job, applied for a job. I assume he's qualified, but he has not gotten a call back from the sheriff's office. I don't know if they're human resources or whatever, but there are qualified people in this county that want a job and need a job and I feel that we need to recruit and, and make it better. We, we have to make it easier <coughs> and I will do that. It's, it's, it's in every division of that sheriff's office we need to be looked at. Every division. In every division. I mean they're not getting equal representation. You see a young black man would you want them at this sheriff's office in Tallahassee County? not going to get no fair shake. You, you, could, you, could buy, you could buy some of those officers and give them base pay raises like he's done. You know, get you get you a new captain and pay him a big salary. Get you a, get you a guy that, that, was, that was a captain to make him a major and give him a big salary. He's going to love his sheriff with the pay raises that he's got. And then you give him a brand new truck to drive back and forth to Tallahassee every day. Your taxpayers are paying that stuff. You, you taxpayers are paying for a brand new Chevrolet to go to Tallahassee every day because he wants that major to be his, his number one man. But that's not right. It's just not right. And they're just doing it all the time. You gotta treat everybody the same way if you're gonna if you're gonna have a fair and impartial sheriff's office. It doesn't happen up there. It doesn't happen. With a new sheriff, it will happen, I can assure you. Send me to, if they have not been 
sponsors and just sitting on their feet with all the pictures they had. They have an extended team. They need to look at it. They need to get an application. They need to get them hired. So we are well protected this year. So, uh, would you believe that there is trust between the community and the sheriff's office? If yes, why? If no, why not? And what would you do as sheriff to build and better establish trust in the community? Well, there is none for us to fill in community at the sheriff's office. When they had the uh, when they had the uh, little churches that were painted up all over us, if we'd have had if we'd have had the trust of the community, those cases would have been solved. The community didn't give us trust this year, so instead of trying to solve it, we went to the community and said, "Please let me work here." Those cases could have been solved. But when you go and tell everybody where the FBI is involved in hate crime and SBO comes in and it, it, we're going to put somebody in prison. You think those two little old boys that are driving around and painting up in churches that we're going to tell anybody? If he'd, have, if he'd have had faith in his community and gone to the community and said, please let me work this, I would have. I said, please let me work this case. I can solve this case. Just back away from it a little bit. Get your school resource officers out there. They would have found out what happened. They would have talked and it could have been solved. But when you had, when the community didn't trust him, you got the FBI talking about a hate crime. You got FDLE coming in. And the sheriff's office was there, but they were just there. They put out a few cameras. He still talks about cameras being out there in front of every church, which is not so. But you could have solved that case if he'd have had trust in the community. He didn't have trust. He still doesn't have the trust. It doesn't matter who he buys that work, come lives in Tallahassee, come down here every day. It don't matter how many pay raises he made to 100 people, ma'am? I told you no, exactly no, what I did. No comment. I told you exactly how I solved that case. And I would have solved the case because it would have been two boys probably in a pickup truck. They'd have bragged about it because when they went down to the golf course and painted that truck that had been down there for three months, it, didn't, it wound up being a criminal mischief. And if, if, they, if the community would have trusted their sheriff's office, that case would have been solved. There's no doubt. You'll never solve it now.
contemplated thirty three million million dollars by all this year. We can't compete with that. We can't get more money. I mean they've done a they've done a biblical way and that's what we have got to do. You know, we've got the crime right now, we've got to keep working on that. We keep working on the drugs, we've got to keep working on that. We got our budget right, we've got to keep working on that. But we have got to get a raise for our investment. We've got this workshop Thursday night. Thursday morning at 10 o'clock at the Career Institute, I encourage all of you to come and fully support and get our investments paid off. Okay. Mr. Miller, uh, same question. <coughs> um, what, what's the top priority for the next term of Sheriff uh, other than public safety? Well, the Sheriff's Trail is right on pay raises. The deputies and correctional officers and all the staff have to get a pay raise. It's a, it's a thing that the, the county commissioners and the county administrators and sheriffs are going to have to work with. Whoever you sit with. <laughs> but we've got to tighten our belts up just like you do at your house when, when, you, when you, you can't pay your electric bill, you can't pay your phone bill, you can't pay, you stop going out to eat and tighten your belts up. You don't go on many vacations all over the state of Florida for promises that don't involve you. We've got to tighten our belt up, be frugal, and make sure that we can pay these deputies what they deserve being paid. Yes, there's, it's a problem, but we, we can tighten our belts and we can make it a little bit easier on the county commissioners to help us with this money. In fact, the money was, that was seized belonged to the sheriff's office. The money was used to get the drug dealer to come to Wakulla County. That drug weren't even going to come here. The incumbent arrested an individual, placed him in the jail for five days, and that individual hadn't even committed a crime, and he was in jail for five days, people. Do you think that that's not going to cost the taxpayer money down the road? Do you think you're not going to have to pay that bill? The guy that actually committed the crime, he got to see the judge the next day. The other guy stayed in jail for five days. Talk to your sheriff from around the county. Talk to them if you know them. See what they had to say about the sheriff here. We need a sheriff the next four years that's making $8,400 a month, $109,000 a year, to be truthful to the citizens of Wakulla County. Budget, I want to do a line out of budget, and I want everybody to know what the sheriff's office is spending money on. If I send someone to a conference, I want, them, I want the citizens to know this guy's going to a conference because he is the jail administrator, and this is a jail administrator's conference, not having a little powwow and sending five or six people, your captains and your majors, to something that doesn't apply to them. And this is happening, folks, all the time. It just happened a couple weeks ago. We've got to stop spending money on stuff that doesn't need to be spent. Mr. Ford, would you care to talk about this one? Thank you, thank you, sir. Sure. Would you support a published account of how the sheriff's office spends the money that they receive? Sure, it's the taxpayer's money. It don't belong to the sheriff. It's the taxpayer's money. I would ask for a, the county administrator to assist us in completing an audit of the sheriff's office. Not an audit that was done four years ago in a day's time from the plan, but I would do, a, I'd have somebody come in and do a complete audit and let the people be trained. Tell them what's going on. We need the people to know what's going on with the sheriff's office. Y'all don't know what's going on. You don't know what's going on at the sheriff's office. You don't know where the money's being spent. You don't know. You need to know it's your money. Board of County Commissioners run this county? One of those questions I think will be answered in the Wakulla News, if not made some other news. 
tough issue. Uh, I think I think the sheriff needs to run into it. He, he's more he's a lot more apt to know what's going on. Uh, I don't think I've dealt with sheriff's offices or county that like Bay County at one time was private. Uh, and I think uh, Marianne is Jackson County, and the sheriff doesn't know what the county's doing with their jail, and and it, it creates a big problem. It creates a big problem. I, I think. Budgets worked out, and they can make. I believe the sheriff can continue to need to run, run the jail. It, it helps in law enforcement aspects. It helps in criminal investigations aspects. When you're out actually working, it's better that the sheriff's office, I believe, have now give it back to the county. And the county have the county. They can say, here, here's your, here's your jail because you're not, you're not giving me enough money to fund it. And the county would have to take it back. And it, it'd be in a bind. The county would be in a bind if they had to take the jail back. I believe it does belong to the sheriff. There's several things people haven't thought about is the sheriff getting the jail up and getting back to Floyd County Commission. One of them is it costs them a lot of money to start it costs. They have to buy new uniforms, they have to buy weapons, they have to buy vehicles, all that belongs to the sheriff. And they have to buy all that stuff to start that. The thing is just to maintain the commission. Like Deputy Waters is, we've got a $1.8 million budget for our ICE detainment unit. If we gave the jail County Commission owns the jail, not the sheriff. A lot of people don't know that. There's four, three or four counties in the state of Florida that the county commission does run the jail, but the, but the sheriff is the best person to run the jail. The sheriff knows it's a better working relationship with the, with the uh, deputies, and it just works better. I've seen jails that are run by the county commission. There's one or two that, are, that run fairly well, but the other ones are very bad. I've been, ba I've been to Bay County Jail, Terrible. GTA, terrible. Uh, that's a private corporation that runs the jail. It's, it's a bad situation. It's not something that we want to look at. I don't think the commissioners would want to look at it. But you know, if, if you got a bunch, if you had some commissioners that were willing to look at it, it's something that can be done because it is the county commission jail. It is not the sheriff's jail. It's the sheriff runs it, and I think it needs to stay that way. That's the sheriff can run it to death. Right. We do work closely with the school systems, and uh, I think we do have the proper procedures in place. And I would, because we can support more training in that area, because it can't happen here in North Carolina County, just like it happens in Florida. I've been a part of them. I've been out there, done some of the work with them. But if you ever have the time, like John Doe said, get with your law enforcement agency. Go out. hundreds of people and they have it at the school or wherever they decide to have it at one of these schools but I believe if you go to your law enforcement agency stand back and be a participant or, or an audience member because there's 
so much work, so much preparation going on. You have people that make sure all the guns are taken away. And all, just all different things. They have just so many different programs that, 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 that have that program. We had one several years back in St. Mark's. There were so many hundreds of law enforcement people were involved in it. Um, uh, needs to go, and I used to run my dog around the teacher's cars as well. 
that's ridiculous. You got, just like Bill said, you got lieutenants that have been there for 20 years that don't make $55,000 a year, risking their lives. They, all the knowledge that they have, that's why people are leaving, because they see that there is injustice and despair. It's not, a, it's not fair. It's not fair. You cannot pay a mate to me a $55,000 a year that's been there two or three years when a deputy's been there for 19 years, and you got all, all these other deputies that have been there for over 10 years that don't even make close to $55,000 a year. That's ridiculous. somewhere because the money's still going to need to be there. Uh, I just, you know, people don't even talk about the private contractors that have worked at the Sheriff's Office, medical staff at the Sheriff's Office. I think that contract, if I could recall four or five years ago, I think that was like $800,000, and I know one of these gentlemen can clarify that up. I think because you had those ICE people, you had to have a special medical staff. It wasn't local medical staff. You had to go contract with them or we're going to take them away from you. And that was a lot of money. Then you had a food service contract that you got to think about. That's a lot of money, too. It's not run like it used to be. All these are private contractors. You have to spend that kind of money. And when you don't have that money, you have to supplement it some way. Well, it's, it is a complex situation. You can't explain it in two minutes. But you read the Wachella News. I, I tried to explain it a little bit within a few hundred pieces of words. But... <laughs>
four thousand dollars. If if you any if you work anywhere in government, if you get a ten percent raise, that's a good raise. That's a thirty four hundred dollar raise. That's I'll take that any day of the week. Twenty percent, that's a sixty eight hundred dollar raise. That's even better. Keep on going. You got twenty one thousand. How much is that? That's a fifty or sixty percent raise. That's unheard of, especially in government. and talk with uh, you know, Under Sheriff Morrison and pass it on to him every time it's a law enforcement. But people kept coming to me. I love the Wakulla County Sheriff's Office. I worked very hard for the Wakulla County Sheriff's Office. And, and I've gained the trust from a lot of citizens in Wakulla County. They trusted in me and they've called me. And I've tried to help them. I just want the Sheriff's Office turned back over to the people and let the people know what's going on with the Sheriff's Office. Thank you. 